<laughs> go okay. Ahead, go ahead. Finish your sentence. <laughs> I haven't. I haven't. I haven't done this in a long time. See, I got nervous. All right, your camera's right here. Right. Do you and look? That, that's my camera right there. I look into the camera because you know I'm just talking, and okay saying hi. What's going on? Hi. Do we? What's that? Sure, yeah. This isn't going to be long. Yeah, We're you just... can tell this is testing. We're just testing. Yeah. Testing, one, two, three. People like this. You know, if someone ends up watching this test, then maybe they'll learn something. Well, that's why I wanted to log into my channel, because when we go live, it will tell people, my people instead of your people. Sure. And then if they want to participate, I can actually, can I? Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, let's, you know, let's figure out the metaphor of how you could successfully broadcast from here and access and reach everything you need. Uh, I would have, like, notes and stuff in front of me or... Something substantial. I got substantial stuff sitting around. I got this book, The Georgians. We can discuss this. Oh, you have notes in front of you, like show prep. There would be show prep. Yeah, show prep really makes all the difference. And I might even, uh, you know, for this type of show where you have video, I, I might have to uh, flip my mic back up. But I had it set up for voiceover so I can read off. And so I wasn't prepared for the test, I guess. I'm just and, opening yeah. the chat. Yeah, and you would you would have the chat yeah, over here and your interwebs access. And uh, in an ultimate scenario, I would not have the, the mic between me and the camera, but this is how it is today. We talk about the terror factory, how the FBI creates pseudo-terrorist scenarios to maintain its funding. It's a very respectable book. When I when I explain that to somebody, yeah, I pull, actually... Pull the arm over. Get oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Get comfortable with your mic. go wherever get, I get like here. Up. There, there we go. go. It makes weird sounds when you move it, but in fact, I'm going to do the same. I'm going to feel free enough to be comfortable. Does that does that camera pivot on that thing that it's on? Uh, it's made to pivot. I might just turn it. That might be the funniest thing you see the whole show. I don't know. What'd you do? It's flipping my mic upside down. Like that. Oh, those things are fun. Um, yeah, so I made those uh, webcam holders out of blocks of wood, and then there's a like a, a washer between them that would allow them to spin freely. But then I painted them, and they're a little stiff. But if you want your camera moved a little bit, where do you want it? Uh, just turn it to your left. Yeah, that's... And then up. Oh, you can see. That's perfect. That looks great. Well, oh, I see what happens. It's running out of cord or something. Hold on. We so, have a technical issue. See, so we're comparing notes on uh, Ustream, and I never look at the cameras. I, I let people be voyeurs. Well, I mean, you have a two-shot setup, so... Yeah. It looks normal if we just have a conversation across, like, uh, like radio show style. We'd be talking like this, and the cameras would be off to the side. Right, but right. But when you, when you have a three-shot up there, we're not really looking like... It doesn't, it doesn't look right, so I just end up talking to the audience, because the people who watch stuff I do in this office are my friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Oh, yeah, that is a little more... You know, that's true, because when I did the show by myself... I did look at the camera. Well, th these was... are uh, these are things that you learn as you learn how to uh, what is how does Gatto refer to it the active literacies. Mm -hmm. So you have to understand the situation. Is it going to make the un the audience uncomfortable if you break down the fourth wall? That's what they call it in the the television and cinema world. That there's this because there's three walls on the set that you can see with the camera. The fourth wall is supposed to be an invisible wall, and we're supposed to act like the cameras aren't really there, and that's called acting. I'm not very good at acting. Right. I know the camera's there. Yeah. And sometimes you're supposed to deliver directly to the audience, and it makes a better connection. Now, if they're supposed to feel like they're in the audience and just observing, then we could look like this, and we talk and we pretend they're not there, and they, you know. But I like to think that people are participating. And sure. And when I talk to people, I usually, you know, look them in the eye. That's usually the protocol. Right. And so I'm saying hi. And I can just look at you at the mo on the, the, the great, monitor great thing right is we below. Have choice, and there's no real decorum. There's no Emily Post book that we could write, you know, read to see what the right thing to do in this situation. Now, interestingly enough, Emily Post, uh, she lived in this town called Tuxedo Park. Uh, it was known as the End of the Rainbow for mm -hmm. those of you who are Stanley Kubrick fans and whatnot. And at the end of the rainbow lived J.P. Morgan and some Astors and some really rich people, Colgate. And uh, that's where Emily Post observed their behavior to tell the other Americans how to act like these people. Now, Tuxedo Park was not named after the famous evening wear. In fact, there was, uh, you know, top hat and tails. That was formal black tie attire. Except these characters in the Tuxedo Park Club cut their tails off. And so when people would see them, like, in their black tie attire without the tails, they, they said to this one dude, uh, you know, what is that? And he's like, oh, that's a man from Tuxedo. 
Well, the, the guy thought, he said, that's a man in a tuxedo. And so that type of attire became known worldwide. And what does everyone rent for their wedding? Tuxedos. Tuxedos. I just, I just rented one. Anglo-American establishment. I'm just saying that it all plays into the... So you can learn about history, and you're just going to learn about everything around you anyway. So, Or the, the, when I was editing the last episode, you had that Brooks Brothers shirt on, and I was like, what is that logo? So what did you what did you learn? Because I didn't I didn't get into that, and I, I I thought it was interesting. I saw the email. I just happened to have it over here because I'd skyped the links to somebody else that didn't know about it, and I was like, oh, you should figure out what that is. All right, uh, first let's see. I, can I cut it over to my? Screen? Yeah, yeah, whatever you need to do. Let's sure. Do I have desktop over here? Let's see. I got a desktop camera right there. It looks funny for a second. Yeah, pull my mic over. I'm out of practice with this. Tuxedo yeah, this park. is. There's a lot of variables. All right, Tuxedo Park. Here's a little evidence. Before we go for Arthur P. Kroll, no known association to the Kroll Security Company in right. 9/11, but right. Uh, there he is, architect. Tuxedo Club, origins of the tuxedo. So that's interesting, but that's not really show material. Where I would go is something like this. Dun da da da. Come on, Firefox fire oh i don't know what this is but it wasn't there yesterday when i last looked at this see that that's the order of the golden fleece can you blow that picture up uh yeah it's, i try not to use phrases like that on the skype I'm right <laughs> okay so. Right, so here's uh let's see i can go back and find an english version but it it comes from one of these dudes called Philip the Good. <laughs> uh, right? It's pretty crazy. All right. First off, uh, even in German, I can figure out that this this order was formed in 1430. So it's been going on a while. Yeah. And if I were to type in... I thought I had another link over there, but it didn't. I would type in Brooks Brothers logo meaning... And then I would go here. I think this was the article I originally read. And when you go down, All right, it says established 1818, but they didn't adopt this logo, it says down here, until, oh, look, there it is. Brooks Brothers, new name and Golden Fleece logo. Uh, it was borrowed from the Order of the Golden Fleece, founded by Philip the Good, Duke of Burgundy, and the Netherlands, in honor of his wife, Isabella. And it's like 50 elite people that were in this membership. And here he is with in this painting with the Brooks Brothers logo. Yeah. Wait, and can I just see the painting again real yeah. quick? Where? Oh, there it is, hanging down. Right, yeah. Right there. And so if I click that link... It takes me to the page in German, but maybe is there... How do you translate on the wiki? Oh, right here. Sprechen the English. The magic. Look at that. Now we can read in our native tongue. January 10th, 1430, Philip the Good. And, and so then I, you know, it's like, why would this clothing company take that logo? But I don't think there's anything nefarious behind it. It's just interesting history. It's like, you know, here's this thing you see all around you. And then, you know, almost, I, I think the number is like, I don't know, 38 out of whatever 42 presidents we've had have worn Brooks Brothers clothing. Well, so this is like the official yeah. outfitters of, uh, of the people we call the ruling elite. Sure. Well, We're this was two pain shot. There we go. This was the uh, big no, swath bad. of just me talking that I cut out of the last show, the sh the show we just did, where I was talking about this experience of, uh, you know, how how quickly could somebody become overwhelmed if they, uh, you know, tried to contemplate the history of everything they passed on a trip from you know their house to the supermarket, uh, every auto body yeah, shop, that'd every a, that'd be a long trip. You can only, you have to try to just pick up a couple things every day right, and right. kind of you know process them. It's like, hey, what's the origin of the fire department? What's the origin of the police station? What's the origin of the hospitals? If you go into the question about the hospitals, you might, if you know how to look for things, you can go back to the Knights Hospitallers, which were the first uh, 
how homosocial order, a men's only club, mm -hmm. Freemasonry, the Knights Templars, the Knights Hospitallers are also a lesser known group, equally powerful in their magnitude through history. So, and there's then you can just you can get ten books on the Knights Hospitallers, and then you'll have a sense of uh, this this uh, philanthropic position of power that they've assumed like one face it's like no we help people it's like no you build those places because you know you'll get business right or control or intelligence so you know history it's pretty cool well there's a few irons in the fire right now and i'm i'm in connecticut we are we're we're right here we're together juice. there's no mm, yeah it's just juice. we are uh uh, you showed me something really interesting last night, which was this OSS psychological profile of his, uh, Hitler, which I think would make a nice addendum to a Nazi series that I did a little over a year ago. Um, I want to read through it, and maybe you know I'll offer it to people, uh, you know, in its PDF form if they want to go through it themselves. But maybe find I half an hour. I actually have very yeah. little interest in Hitler. Like I could care less. Like he, you know, people say he's evil and all this stuff, but when you start digging into the history, and you're like, wow. Like, Hitler was really evil. No question about it. He's a bad guy. Yeah. But there was these other people that were in this country and in Britain. They were basically putting them up to all of it, funding them, providing the, the metal and the armaments and helping those companies become international conglomerates. The Dulles brothers, especially working on behalf of the Rockefellers and Standard Oil, helped German companies, Nazi companies, become international conglomerates so that no matter who won the war, those companies could survive. And the Thiessen Krupp company, it was Fritz Thiessen, who was... Uh, I.G. Farben, and, yeah. And the Krupp family, which has produced armaments since like the 1500s, they had a multi-century business of making armaments, right? Those two combined, and they're still one of the biggest companies in Europe, if not the world today. And, and there's a lot of Thiessen Krupp elevators and all sorts of other shenanigans in this country, so it's... And and when we did those shows, uh, well, actually, I think I did all. You know, you and Tony were in part of one. Just sure. a, a clip of you talking, but it was pretty much just a monologue that I did for. It was, I think, a total of six hours, and really just scratched the surface of the the behind the scenes. I mean, you know, history can be obviously examined from these different perspectives, and one of the the big ones is the trends and forces. So, really comparing what was going on in Germany to you know what is happening in the United States today was more of a trends and forces approach, where it didn't matter who was really pulling the strings behind the background because the people were sitting ducks for whoever it was for you know a variety of reasons. So um, I think that there are interesting things in the OSS psychological profile of Hitler because it talks about the people's perceptions of him, and that's something that I'm, I'm really interested in, in digging into. Um, and the other one was um, an addendum to the series that we just concluded on, um, b well, basically dealing with um, truth versus power in the 20th century um, and collectivism versus individualism. Uh, Cody sent me uh, an interesting article that, I, mean, I, I think there's a lot of people in my audience who respond to Rothbard as, you know, certainly sure. a, an authority. And I don't know if you've ever read For New Liberty or The Ethics of Liberty. Um, I've only read parts of Rothbard. I've had people threaten to give me Rothbard books, but I, and, you know, I haven't. I've only read his work from afar, so yeah. I'm still very much open-minded and looking forward to learning. Yeah, For New Liberty, which is available, um, uh, you, you, you could easily get it. I, I, I think like Mises, Mises uh, University on... Uh, iTunes would offer it as a, a free audio book, and and you know if you wanted to, oh, I have everything downloaded from the. Mises so you have site. it yeah, then. I have it. I just need to look for a new liberty. Is yeah, what I'm searching for. And in the Mises Institute, it's also there in in PDF form with, um, you know, it, it's a really good table of contents. So even if you just wanted to scan through it, it can just jump you right to whatever page you want to go to. Um, but uh, yeah, that was a, a really uh, important read for me. Uh, a few years ago, and really helped solidify a lot of things. Um, I'm I'm far from having things solidified, but I do know from like reading the private and intimate papers of Colonel House, the four volume set, right? Uh, that these guys were up to no good, and he was being handled, and you can tell who he's being handled by. Like the you know, it's pretty, it's pretty much uh, a clear insight into 
the machinations behind World War One, the Versailles Treaty, because you don't have the Nazis. Let's let's step away from Hitler. He's just one dude. The yeah. Nazis are, are worse because there there are a bunch of people who are like Hitler. Right. Right. right sure. Okay. So uh, they would never be the Nazis without Paris, nineteen nineteen, and you know the incredible infl- hyperinflation that was put upon upon that country. And America also had a stock market crash. Yeah. We didn't become fascist. They tried the you know the business. The business plot of 1934, on which the McCormick Dickstein Committee had hearings, and that's Smedley Butler. Uh, for those of you playing at home, who's a the most dec- highly decorated Marine general of all time, and he was so, he was two congressional winner, right, you know, to lead winner. this, yeah, and they propositioned him to overthrow FDR and to lead a you know a team of 500,000 men to make the country fascist. Uh, so that's what I like to call the gas pedal people. Like the, there's a ruling class and there's a bunch of people who want to maintain their position in the ruling class. I call them the, the brake people, the brake pedal, right? They understand the nature and the fragility of their establishment and they just want to keep it going. These other people are like, we got to hurry up and get it done before they figure it out. And they're always trying to speed ahead. And so when you say that the, you know, the ruling elite are competing among themselves, no, they're not really competing among themselves because that competition's a sin, according to Rockefeller. And when you figure out like where he got his money from and that power structure, it's like those are the working rules. But they do disagree on how fast things get done, right? And so there are people who are trying to take giant steps to get us all under like a cybernetic smart right. grid, get us locked down. And then there's Fabians. There's, then there's other people saying, hey, look, slow and easy wins the race. Right. Let them forget about this stuff. And Facebook, you know, Mark Zuckerberg saying they're all dumb fucks or, you know, I can say that on the show. So sure, yeah. Right? Uh, so it's like they're, they treat us like we're stupid and they expect us to never remember anything. And if you can just, you know, out, overcome that stupidity thing, which is learning how to use a question mark. It's pretty simple. Yeah. And, you know, you do that persistently. You're going to get out of the traps that they're setting for everybody. I mean, because they're, they're setting the same trap for everybody. And it's just basically you have to be stimulus response and not think about what they're doing. And you have to forget that there's any history in this world. And if you do those two things, you're under their control. Right. Right. So those are like to get out of their control. You got to have a sense of history and you got to figure out fact from fiction. Yeah, and having some some contextual understanding is very important too. Which because means take in every primary source that you can access or afford to have access to. Right. Well, because and I think that stimulus response happens not because people are stupid, but just they don't have the time and they don't care. So okay, they here's the thing: the effort. How should I feel about it? Like people sure. go to magazines. We were talking about this last night. Yeah. People go to magazines to learn how to dress, yeah. and and that's not because you know. Uh, life is a busy thing, yeah. you know? And and some people do have some useful things figured out already, right. but then they go above and beyond form and function, and it's like, well, you're not anybody unless you, you know, are up with the latest trend this year. Yeah. And that's why you see all these different fashions come at you. It's like the 70s, bell bottoms. The 80s, people had cuffed pants. And the 90s, you know, they had MC Hammer pants. It's like these extreme fashions. Well, the elites don't buy into those extreme fashions they're always just staying classic because they're you know they stay in fashion all the time they right they you know they're they're the ones defining fashion for other people and as far out as you go on that limb they've designed all that and it's like hey look this guy will wear pants with a crotch that go all the way down to his ankles isn't that hysterical and we can make it a trend and you know this sort of thing or this reminds me of the Dave Chappelle. Me, them making it, yeah, yeah, you know where he says, you know, he, he, to make it in in this really fucked up business of Hollywood, if you're black, sooner or later they're going to dress you like a woman. Dressed, yeah, yeah, um, and that's not a conspiracy theory. That is a provable trend, and it has to do with dominance and submission. It has to do with some really monkey primal things that we need to work out of our culture. It's the use of force, fraud, and coercion. And it's like, hey, if you want access to the same thing this white guy has, you have to wear a woman's outfit. Right. Yeah. I don't know. Like, I would be worried about who came up with that, but I'd be more worried about the people who thought it was cool for all these years to do that to people because it's not cool. Right. Unless they want to do it of their own volition, but the people that I've heard from have not wanted to participate. Yeah, I, I think uh, you know Dave Chappelle and Martin Lawrence. I was going to say Martin Lawrence yeah. went running down the highway in his underwear, telling people what was up. They're trying point. to kill me. Yeah. 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 Um, Randy Quaid. Randy Quaid. I don't know that. Uh. Dennis Quaid's brother, lesser known brother, Randy Quaid, famous sure. from Christmas Vacation. Right? All, all of those films, he's yeah. Wearing, he's wearing the dicky. Shitter's full. That's my favorite quote. <laughs> uh, he had to flee America and he went to Canada because 
he and his wife were being taken advantage of by their Hollywood lawyer, who's a well-known gangster out there, and was basically creating false insurance accounts and buying properties in his name. And then he found out that they had done it to other celebrities, celebrities who ended up dead, and they were taking the insurance money from these dead celebrities, and he named names, and then they basically tried to do crazy shit to him. So he went to Canada. He held a press conference. Paul Verge said, hey, did you hear about Randy Quaid? I'm going to go interview him. I said, I would stay the fuck away from that whole situation. Like, that is incendiary, and I don't see how anyone could possibly benefit right now. Like, we're inexperienced, like, people just learning what's going on. Yeah, yeah. And to put yourself, like, obviously for him to leave his situation and for his brother to basically be like, whatever, I'm going to continue working with these people. Yeah. Like, there are serious things that, like, you know, don't play with stuff until you figure out how it works. Yeah. That's dangerous. I really, uh, I'd like to understand better what happened, what really happened with Hollywood in the 1950s when pressure was coming from the government, from HUAC, and it seemed like most people, um, uh, you know, pr- people who were either financiers or, or high level producers or studio execs, they said, yeah, we'll play along. We'll, we'll, you know, as soon as there was a little bit of pressure applied, not saying that it originated from, you know, the House Un-American Activities Committee, but they said, yeah, we'll, you know, we'll be a PR arm of, you know, whatever you're trying to do uh, over the course of the next decade. And, um, you know, 10 people famously opposed that and sure. were blacklisted. And, um, you know, that seems also, from, from what I gathered, I mean, and I, I didn't really devote too much time to that in the series, but I looked into it because, I mean, every, you know, every minute of talking in those shows, you sure. see there's all these avenues that you can pursue. And I was saying, well, is this really, was this a significant turning point? Like, obviously, it didn't originate there because people understood what Hollywood was and the power that it had well before that. I think America and, understood the power that... Germany also had in its cinema and Russia had in its cinema and there was competition going on and during a couple of world wars one of those markets or two of those markets got completely wiped out. Have you ever seen yeah, have you ever seen Potemkin? Uh Battleship Potemkin, yeah. Yeah. Uh who's the filmmaker? Do you remember his name? I'm ashamed right now. Somebody can I, I do. I mean I um Hey, if you're in our chat, you can, which a few people are, you could look up <laughs> Battleship Potemkin and tell me the filmmaker. It's a Russian propaganda film from the 1920s. Um, the other one is the German Expressionist movement, uh, movement with people like Fritz Lang. Yeah, yeah. Um, Fritz Lang made Metropolis, which if you've never seen, I didn't really have any interest in checking out those movies yeah. throughout my whole life. Right. I knew they existed. I was like, whatever, old movies. But then I started getting into history and learning about this stuff, yeah, and I was like, wow, Fritz Lang is laying out some occult symbolism in that movie and just showing the difference between the top dwellers and the bottom dwellers. Yeah. And arguably, I can't remember if, uh, did H.G. Wells write The Time Machine prior to that? Because he had the Morlocks and the Eloi, the people that live underground and prey on the people on the top, and it was you know, right. same, a similar metaphor being expressed. But it was, uh, it's a powerful movie. Sure. I think... Um there's another i think it was fritz lang too it was it was definitely german um it was was it it was called german expressionism um versus not to be confused with german idealism um and it was called uh, the cabinet of dr caligari which oh, yeah, is I've even more I've fucked than that, oh, yeah, the other it's... movie a lot of times when I watch stuff, it's not because I enjoy it. It's because, like, well, you got to figure out what, what's being told in the past, what people were under the influence of, and it's more like a sociological or anthropological study. Right. So, I mean, both both Russia and Germany had major... I think you could say that cinema really took off there in a big way, um, but prior to uh, in the United States, because I, I don't think there was... From what I remember from from you know knowing some cinema history, there wasn't a, a tremendous amount of interest in American cinema prior to the jazz singer in um, nineteen twenty seven when those Al Jolson uh, yeah which was the first mo- talking movie um, and uh, there there were obviously some some interesting cinematic feats like the work of uh, D W Griffith prior to that. Birth of a Nation. Birth of a Nation, and the home. other one um, what was the other the other movie that he made. I want to say Sunrise, but that's something totally different. He had he had another sort of epic like that. We have an intruder in the studio. I didn't realize I was going into this. Yeah, go in front of the camera. Go ahead. I just have to look at her a second. 
Go in. Look oh, at, look. Eisenstein. Yeah, Eisenstein. Sergey Eisenstein. The, uh, I pulled it up. Yeah. I should have pulled it up on this computer so you could see it on the desktop, but I'm not taking this pre-show testing very seriously. <laughs> no, this is this is fantastic. Uh, if, if people have any questions uh, as people are coming into our chat, uh, put them in there, and I'll be able to look at them in just a second. So, um, are you all set? You yeah, can, I just okay. Sure. Oh, I forgot uh, to mention the Odessa Steps sequence from Battleship Potemkin mm -hmm. uh, was reenacted in not Goodfellas. The Untouchables. But Untouchables. I learned about that in film class in high school, I think. Right. And then I hadn't seen either of those movies at that time. But as you get older, you're like, oh, now you see that movie, you're like, oh, I see what they're doing here. Yeah. Drawing in your attention, slowing things down. Oh, all right. I, it, it was really... Uh, well done in the Untouchables, which I don't think is a fantastic movie, but no, but there's some there's some interesting, interesting st there. stuff in there. I also recommend Miller's Crossing if you like a good old style gangster movie. Made, Cohen Brothers, made yep. in the nineties. Yeah, <laughs> Miller's Crossing I think was made in the 80s? yeah yeah eighties nineties yeah like early nineties. I thought it was one of the Cohen Brothers' first movies, but I think it, it pretty pretty much was. It's, uh, Someone said, I just got here. Who is this person? Who Who is this person? I know. You got no lower thirds on your show, fool. <laughs> I know. Well, usually that's sufficient because everybody knows who oh, wait, everybody wait. is. I might have some lower thirds over here. Hold on. And I make, uh, I make graphics if I have a guest. All right. Let me just check. Because that's a good point. Let me, I, got a, I got one for Brett here. Dun, dun. Now I'm releasing all my secrets. Oh, it's in the lower thirds. Oh man, I hate it how it censors links. I gotta fix that. Brett Vinat, lower third, coming up. Let's see if this. Brett looks like he's working out in of the basement of the FBI, like <laughs> Agent Mulder. <laughs> Welcome to the Z files. You missed the Y files. It went straight to DVD. Uh, Brett's lower third. I could put. Oh, I gotta put it on a layer below that. So if you if you are just joining us, we're we're basically just testing. Um, we turn stuff on. They called you. Yeah, we're going to we're going to do uh, a show tomorrow night, and uh, I think we we both admit that we're maybe a little out of practice with this. Uh, I haven't done a live show since July 9th. I do my show downstairs. I'm well in practice in the studio. I just never use the office. But stuff. you use UStream? No, we tape we we pre film it. Right. Yeah. And then I. Not that Ustream is any kind of a right. feat, but it can... I got a lower third working, but I'd have to turn off this upper third so you can see it. And then it says, Brett Finot, host of the School Sucks podcast. See that? But oh. I'm not set up for the split screen. or I'm not set up for this. Oh, that looks good. Then. That looks really good. And then I can bring my lower third in here. I got one somewhere. RG. Lower third. Podcast. UHL. There we go. And then if I talk, I just go like that. And it's me. And if I do this, it would almost look almost look normal. It would need resizing and stuff. Look at that. It just throws up there. Now it's on some annoying loop, so I'm going to remove it. These are the things you can do. There we go. So those are just MP4s? Yeah. Uh, you render them with an alpha channel, and that's how they have the transparency. I had to do my grammar, logic, and rhetoric to get here. You see how that works? Look, everyone, Brett's yes. amazed. I am. I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm very impressed. I'm, I've, I've been here for a little more than 24 hours, and this is a very impressive operation. It's not meant to impress anybody, but I'm glad you're impressed. No, it, it certainly does. What you can't see is we got there's books, there's facts around here. These are all pieces of evidence as far as I'm concerned. And yeah, a big crime. So, can you explain the the organization of like what's behind you there, or the method to? Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. My bottom shelf. Uh, we could probably turn it like this. Sure. Bottom shelf are my grammar books. So these are dictionaries and you know books that you would use as tools to work up. Uh, this is logic. These are individual component evidence pieces, uh, you know, books that are published on, you know, component aspects. And then the top shelf and the stuff that's stacked on top of the shelf, those are like full on 
uh, results of their grammar and logic being put into action. Mm -hmm. So that was the way it was originally organized. This uh, right here on screen, these are all Council on Foreign Relations monthly publications called Foreign Affairs. And I have some that go back into like the 40s and 50s. And that was one of the ones that I used in the last episode from, right. from yep. 19, 1998 where they're telling you... They were saying that, you know, catastrophic terrorism is a real possibility in America and that they might need to, you know, fight people with weapons of mass destruction named Osama bin Laden who might attack the World Trade Centers. And it was, you know, it's right there in writing. And they sell it on... Uh, when I was in whatever store, Kindle store or whatever... That is one of the two books that I have on my used iPad mm -hmm. is uh, the Foreign Affairs Journal from 1998 where they wrote these two articles talking about Osama bin Laden as enemy number one, bad guy number one, and this, this thing that could happen with catastrophic terrorism, talking about Pearl Harbor, World Trade Centers. Do you want to see the, you, do you no, want we, no, we a closer look? We compared notes because I had a couple from 1999 and 2000. Um, that were, you know, pushing pushing those same stories. Uh, somebody says, Richard has really nice graphics, production values, looks like he uses a professional. You want to respond to that? I think they might have just come in after yeah, what I don't you have said. Yeah, I don't have a professional or anything. Uh, I was just showing Gret, uh, Brett, Brett uh, how to make the, like, the spinning globe in the background and how it was made at different layers, and I was showing them After Effects and... Uh, uh, the graphics that I have for the history show, I bought a template from Video Hive or one of these places that sells After Effects template. I'd be happy to provide the link. And then I changed the, uh, the content myself because you mm -hmm. learn, you know, I use the trivia method. So when I find something I don't know how to do, I go through the, the basic parts of it and figure out how it interacts. And I was able to change the templates. And I don't, I have a graphics guy that I worked with for years who's an American who's been scraping along living in Italy and he's got a wife over there. And, uh, but I, he's been like MIA for the past, I don't know, a long time since he made graphics. He made, the uh, last thing he made was the history logo and that was it. Everything from then I've kind of, kind of bastardized some of the graphics he made and amended them and made some new ones. But I appreciate that, uh, notice taken that I've been doing a little work trying to improve. Yeah, yeah. I just and I just wanted you to definitely speak to that. So, because it's it's uh, and, you know not to obviously knock the person who said it, but I think uh, it's an astute observer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> it does look like you might use a professional. No. Um, but if I used a professional, I'd have a lot more graphics. I'd say. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. basically, what I do for the history show is repurp like it's the same info screen. I was showing Brett how how I made all the different pieces and whatnot. So it's like. There are lower thirds. There's uh, insets that would take like half the screen and would have info over here. You know, it's the same sort of thing that you see on the news at night. They just make packages because there's a bunch of different companies around the world that have to do those sort of things that don't have in-house talent. I'm one of those groups that don't have in-house. I don't have in-house anything. I can learn how to do it myself. So uh, people will give you a start with a template. You do a little learning on your own, and it can look like a lot more expensive operation than what you have. Which and this process for you started 10, 11 years ago? Well, realizing that things were not how I was taught in school. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Learning how to make media, oh, that was a slow process. Like, I didn't really catch on to how much I had to learn yeah. in order to get it. So I've done more learning about how to do production in the past year than I have in the past seven years of production. So, it's like, I've put... In I've taught myself cinematography and lighting and, you know, presentation styles and all the different areas. If you had a crew, you'd have people doing sound and all these different areas. I just basically learned how to do all those things myself. And then I break down the production so I can layer it such that I can do it. I can be the talent behind the desk. I can be the editor upstairs. I have a fight with myself all the time from down there and up here because, like, I'll screw something up. I'm like, oh, I'm just screwing the editor upstairs. Screw him, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then I come upstairs. I'm like, motherfucker. Like, why, <laughs> why did you do that? Like, why didn't you just go back and repeat this or whatever? Uh, so, yeah, it's it's like juggling chainsaws. Well, yeah, I, I think that when, when we get into doing this, and obviously, you know, we're, we're at different stages with what we're doing, Um but uh, first, you kind of see the you know the spectrum of everything that needs to be done, like all the channels through which you need to communicate. It's overwhelming. And then you start to see the depth, right? So a couple of years ago, I said more overwhelming. Yeah, the, well, right. It can <laughs> be. It can be. Um, 
but uh, you know, there's tools. Yeah, and, and one day at a time, and you learn a little bit each day. Like I didn't learn After Effects and Premiere. Like I didn't learn the graphic editing, video editing, g- graphic creation. Yeah, I didn't learn any of that stuff in one day. And I didn't learn them all at the same time. It's like I put off learning After Effects for a long time until I was a competent editor. I put off video editing for a long time until I was a competent audio editor of my podcast. Sure. And so it's a, it's a natural progression. So even though it's like you might look at the top of the mountain where you want to go, and it's like, oh, that's so far off. And then look down. It's like, oh, but I can take a step. And if I take a step, then I can figure out how to take another step. And you have to persist despite... I say it's persistence despite resi- uh, resistance. Yeah. Persist despite the resistance. And that's the key to success. It's like uh, maybe I was too naive to quit a lot of times. Well, it sounds like <laughs> it sounds like you're very patient, too, because, you know, whenever I accomplish something, like a small feat, sure. like when I, I, I said, okay, I'm a podcaster or I have these ideas I want to communicate. Okay, what's the media through which I can communicate it? So you have the podcast, sure. fine, you have a website, you have video. Right, so as soon as I, okay, so then I said, okay, one thing is video. Now sure. this was just the very basic wedding, uh, dipping my toes kind of process here. So it's okay, how do I make a video? And you know, I figured it out how to do it in a pretty basic way. It's and I high fived myself and I said, I made a video. So I put it out. Right now, I know. Uh, from I mean I have a degree in communications not that it's worth much today but I I know the layers of video production right. and I'm um you know observant enough to watch television and watch something on YouTube and be able to see the quality difference oh sure you know and, and the amount of knowledge that has to go into you know, ironically <laughs> the a mainstream cable yeah. production versus you know a really maybe educational and insightful YouTube video that has low production value. Well, it's so easy I, enough to make a video cuz you just press record on any one of your devices these days and anyone can make a video. Sure. The key is how to make a video that holds people's attention mm-hmm. that uh, not obeys certain rules but doesn't violate certain rules of communication. And so it comes back to uh, planning and forethought and consideration. There's a lot of thought that goes into it. And then as far as production value, what you discover is if you don't make something that's at least as good as the, the worst infomercial on TV, mm-hmm. people aren't going to watch it. You could be telling them the, the secret of life, but they're not going to watch it because they can't hear you. They can't see you. Like You know what I'm saying? The lighting's off. The sound's off. Unless they get that feeling where it's like, okay, all the distractions are gone. This is a tight presentation. Now I can focus on what they're saying, right? It's like even today when I was uh, checking in on the Alex Jones show, I kind of maybe it was last night's rerun or whatever, but uh, the exposure was off. So what that means is you're not getting the true color. You're letting too much light into the lens, and things are blown out. And I was like, it's you know, you see people that that do it every day. They're mm-hmm. professionals. They do that every day. And yet one little thing slips by because it's a live production and you don't see it until you're editing. So it's like a mistake that everyone I've made it. I've, I've gotten up here to the editing bay and I'm like, uh, yeah, I had two, it's two stops, too much light. And what I got to do now, I got to futz with it in the editor and try to bring down the exposure. And so then the question is, how do you consistently get exposure? Well, there's a tool for that. And then once you learn to use the tool, Every camera looks the same consistently, and that's the type of thing that you need to build before. Like, it's a skill you need to build before you can ever move to the next step of trying to tell a story through film. Because let's say you got a great script and you spent all this money and you got all this stuff, and then you went out and shot a bunch of scenes that when you cut them together, they're not going to match because the lighting in this angle wasn't the same as this angle. And then you learn about why Hollywood productions or TV productions cost so much. Well, they're filming each scene a lot of times with one camera. I mean, even even today, they do things multiple times. And so when Tom Cruise is talking to Cameron Diaz and you see Cameron Diaz, she's lit. And then they break the whole set down. They do it again. And he's lit. Right. So like the, the direction of the sun will change. These are subtle changes in lighting that people don't pick up on, but they pick up on if you don't do it. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's like. Uh, there, I don't think it's very natural. I think once people know about that, they're going to see it in all those movies all the time. It's like, oh, they're lighting both stars, right? Because in reality, light comes from one way in, in the sky. 
Yeah. Right. So somebody's going to have their face in the shadow, but you can't have that in Hollywood. You know, you're paying to see their face on screen and all this other stuff that goes into it. In fact, when they when they first invented the close up, Mm -hmm. they said people won't accept this. Like we're paying all this money for this celebrity. A lot of actors wouldn't do them. A lot of actors wouldn't do them. You you know, you can't. And so it's about these rules. It's I have a book called The Grammar of Filmmaking. Yeah. That breaks down these implicit rules that have been developed by Eisenstein and all these other people whose names I won't probably won't be able to remember. Uh, to to be able to communicate smoothly without jarring people during the story. It's just like driving with shocks on your car instead of just like this, you know, up and down change in scenes and stuff. There's a flow to the movie and you can suspend your disbelief and actually, you know, participate in the the, the viewing experience, which is very pleasant. Right. What you don't like is when all of a sudden the background music's too high and you can't hear the dialogue and you're reaching for your remote or closed captioning and stuff like that. And it's like that unsuspends your disbelief. All of a sudden, you're you're struggling to like see the person or whatever. And so, the production values that you notice between videos people make and what you see on TV or movies, the first rule is that sound is like seventy five percent of the experience. So let's say you have a great movie shot on a hundred thousand dollar camera and all this lighting. If the sound sucks. People aren't going to watch it. People are going to think the lighting's bad. They're going to yeah. think something's off because they can't identify like what that thing is. Yeah. But once you find out that like you know sound is almost everything in a movie and like the visuals are a very small part of that experience. They're an important part of the experience. That's what makes the movie. But without the the sound being believable and clear and audible, and that's why there's just like so much money in post production wrapped up around uh, the sound effects, sound editing, effects, and sound. Yep. What are they? Uh, I forget the name for the people that make the noises. There's a there's a there's a term. It's like gaffer, but it's not gaffer. Uh, Foley. They're called Foley artists. Yeah, they're the ones that make the footsteps and stuff. So, like in a movie, uh, you got you hear a guy's footsteps walking down the sidewalk. In real life, you never you, you don't hear that. If you went outside and recorded the guy walking down the street, you wouldn't hear anything. But if you're showing a cinematic movie and you can't hear footsteps going up the stairs or down the sidewalk. You'll think it's a shitty movie. I guarantee it. Like, I've seen it. I've tried it. I was like, I don't believe that. Go waste a couple hours of your time on somebody who doesn't put the fully, you know, audibility in there to give you, like, this sense of richness that we're used to. Mm Mm-hmm. So I'm not saying we have to continue doing stuff like that into the future. No, and but if you want to hold people's attention to give them a new message, to let them think differently or any of these things, you got to kind of come at them in a direction that they're used to consuming data like that. Yeah, and sometimes it's it's the people who break the rules who have the the biggest impact. I mean, cinematography that reminds me of so many so many people in the 60s and the 70s who were doing things, um, you know, Gordon Willis, the guy who who did The Godfather, sure. right? Where he... He's in that documentary that I was talking about. Was he in the documentary that you were talking about yesterday? He's not in... I was talking I was talking to Rich yesterday about a documentary called um, Side by Side, which is interviews all these, you know, great filmmakers from Lucas to Scorsese to Spielberg to uh, Robert Rodriguez about Hollywood's transition from photochemical film to uh, digital filmmaking over the really the course of the last 10 years and and the innovations in that and it was it was very interesting and it really you know changed my opinion uh, or, ma- or made me think um, you know more about like my opinion of George Lucas and the you know notoriously bad Star Wars prequels but um, that shouldn't take anything away from the it fact It is called you know, Riding with Light because it's Victoria Victoria Storaro. Yeah. Uh, so. There's another one, and I wonder if that's like a, 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 a newer version of this one that was made uh, probably in the early 90s called Visions of Light, uh, which unfortunately is a difficult film to find online. I'm, I'm thinking it was probably made in the early to mid 90s. And, um, you know, Visions of Light talks about the history of cinematography all the way back to the to the very beginning, like the, you know, arrival of a train um, all the way through probably probably the 1990s. And uh, all these things that most people who who they watch a film and they say, well, I'm experiencing something here. There's something that's going on that's having an effect on me, but I don't know what it is. And you know, you you sense it implicitly, but you need the explicit, here's the term for what they're doing right there. Right. So Gordon Willis, I I think I was um, mentioning him that, you know, he lit The Godfather from entirely above. And this is probably how I look right now because I'm wearing a hat and you look a little bit like that because you're lit from above. You would have like these Raccoon eyes. Yeah, yeah. Now that's definitely, 
definitely a no-no, yeah. you know, by any any standard of lighting anywhere. But it's reality. But and it also created authenticity. Yeah, and it also it wasn't just the authenticity, which is definitely true because we are, you know, if we're in a room a lot of the time lit Light. from above. Right. And we have raccoon eyes and that's how we look. But because it was so unfamiliar to a film audience, it was also kind of like it it gave the stars of the movie this sinister look that people who are the stars of movies usually don't have. Right. So it was quite brilliant. It was it, it was it was very interesting. And then uh he was also um he did the Godfather Part Two, and there are some scenes in the Godfather Part Two where you can barely see anything. Yeah. Because it's so dark. And that's what he wanted. Yeah. And that's what he wanted. But that was a real chance back then. Like yeah. people weren't cool with it. And he basically he had a vision and he had control over that situation, so he could do right. what he, you know he did sure. it. Uh, you know, there's uh the the guy you meant Vittorio uh, Vittorio Storaro. Uh, he's a famous cinematographer. He's one of the he's like the world's top cinematographer. Yeah, and uh, I believe he did. Um, he I think he might have done a couple of Terrence Malick's movies. Um, I think he did Days of Heaven, which was like this. Really hard to watch, but very story wise, but very beautiful uh, movie that Terrence Malick made with Richard Gere. Um, by the way, if you don't know who Terrence Malick is, he's a filmmaker whose who's, his career spans like 50 years and he's made like four movies. So he kind of, in the style of Stanley Kubrick, puts, puts some thought into them. I don't, I, I, I don't Vittorio know. Vittorio Storaro is known for Apocalypse Now, yeah. The Last Emperor, Last Tango in Paris. And sixty two sixty other titles. Dune. Days of Heaven? Oh, he did the miniseries, so Day, Days of Heaven. Let me look. He did Little Buddha. Little Buddha didn't like it. Uh let's see. Bunch of bunch of films in the Italian language. His first film was Attack of the Normans. How far back are we going? 1962, I think. He's definitely interviewed in this other film, Visions of Light. Um, one of my favorite movies is uh, Raging Bull. Have you seen that? Of course. Yeah. Which was a, 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 an Jake LaMotta. And De Niro puts on, what, 40 pounds to win the Academy 60 Award? 60 pounds in months. Like I a think, couple of months. I think, it, I think it keeps growing. I'll have to check the records on that. See if it's been exaggerated. I always heard 60. <laughs> So um, in their pre pre casino days, uh, you had Joe Pesci mm -hmm. and uh, Nero in Raging Bull. Yeah, right. That was right. Joe, that was Joey the Fish. Joe Pesci. Joey the Fish. Joey the Fish. That's what Pesci means. Joey the Fish. Ah, yeah, Joe that's Fish. right. Yeah. That's right. Joe Fish. Um, but they are actually uh, they are changing speeds that they were moving the film through the camera during the boxing scenes to create this this disorientation that really when i first saw the movie um because i think i saw casino that was the first one i saw so we're going back to my senior year in high school i said this is a really cool movie and i had just learned that you well who makes a movie and you know that's important <laughs> you know you know go ahead no i was listening to oh um so uh, from there i said okay well Live studio what else has this who done and the next movie I saw was Goodfellas, and I said, that's an even better movie. Yeah. So I went and got all the movies, and when I saw Raging Bull, I didn't know that much about you know the, the these layers world. that we're talking about, yeah. but I said, something is happening here that's really <laughs> affecting me, but I don't know what it is, and it was, it was very interesting. And then I learned what it was, and it was, I was even more excited. So. And this has been an unplanned sound check and conversation on the School Sucks podcast. Yeah. Yeah, dinner's ready whenever you want. Okay. Hey, thanks everyone for for uh joining us. Uh, All right, we'll so be just back. before we go, uh we we looked clear, sound clear, and everything yeah. came through. Yeah, it, can can someone confirm that our sound quality is good? Are you Video getting more quality than is good? 4 frames a second or when I move my hand does it go chop 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 chop? <laughs> Yell louder, I can't hear you. Yeah, right below <laughs> where you're watching us, you'll see a keyboard. Type one, type one, if everything was okay. Yeah, we need to come up with a set of signals, dude. Yeah. Type one, type two. Uh, 
Sound is good. Video is clear. You're both pretty dark. Oh yeah, well, we don't have the. We've other been at on. the beach all day we didn't plan on tanning. Uh, we uh yeah we're not lit so we'll be uh we'll do this again tomorrow and we'll be lit. The light is over. I just want to try. Let's see. I just want to see if it'll play through YouTube how it sounds if the volume's too loud. Sure. So let me refresh this page and then I'll cut to it so whoever's watching can see it. Desktop. Reduce. <laughs> Type 1 if you need it louder, type 2 if you need it quieter. One for louder. Uh, wait, no, I'm I'm just repeating the request. One for louder, two for quieter. Okay, um, let's say that you are the other guy that you're waiting to type one or two. You are the other guy. Yeah. Because some other guy is saying the other guy will do it. You're the other guy. So you do it. <laughs> the idea would be when, I, when we play a clip, if we play a clip. We they don't... say it's stuttering like mad. Okay, so that means oh, okay. that we're, we're probably... When I would get dragged Any, like anytime, that, anytime, yeah, you get dragged anytime you try to play something off your computer. But I figured since we were streaming YouTube it, within UStream, it might have played. But uh, it does it drag sound or does it drag just the video? I know the video is going to drag, but if it drags sound, somebody's and then somebody after that says, "Oh, hey James, um, it might be um, it, it might also be your uh, connection." Or the machine that you're trying to watch us on? Did any very you know, some somebody else confirms that it's very choppy? Is it still choppy? Because I'm getting a one. Oh, that was for too loud. Uh, all right. All right. Uh, living room fine. All right. That's the conclusion of this sound check. Thanks, everybody. We'll talk to you soon. Can you just? Uh...